Thrifting and upcycling has become a big business over the last several years, and one couple who has led the way are our guests today here on the podcast, Jamie and Zeb with Jamie Ray Vintage. They shop at their local thrift stores, purchasing items that they believe have the most potential to upcycle and sell for a profit. They have even made a few trips to Europe to buy, ship back to their home in Utah, and upcycle. Today, they share how they achieve success and impart with us several tips on how to go about the thrifting and upcycling business for yourself. If you want to tune into more than the audio, go to enjoyzebra.com and scroll down to podcasts under company. Then click on the YouTube link provided. Stay with us, friends. We have the inspiration, fun, and community that will platform your day. Well, hello, Zeb and Jamie. How are you guys today? Doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. You know, it's so good to have you on the podcast. Um, I have followed you guys for a long time, and uh, I enjoy those thrift um, videos that you guys do when you guys go to the market uh, go to this consignment stores and do your shopping. Uh, I, I, there's probably like a lot of people that are going, no, don't get that. Don't get that piece or get that piece. Uh, cause that's, that's a tough thing that you guys go through when you're, when you're shopping for just the right pieces to upcycle. Well, we're excited to discuss all things, uh, thrifting and upcycling today. However, it's, uh, almost December. In fact, this podcast is going to air, uh, December 6th. So most of my audience knows I love weather and I have a fascination with weather and you guys live in Utah. So if you don't mind, give me an update on <laughs> what the weather's like in Utah you today. Know, it's funny because if you watch our thrifting videos every Monday, we talk about the weather. So like if people yes. watch the replay, we'll be driving, like, we'll be like, weather? it's raining or it's snowed or, you know, here in Utah, we're, we're high desert. So you know, we can we can have all the seasons in the same day, even even in December. Like it might be 50 next week, but it's going to be 17 tonight. Yeah, it's kind of a mixed bag right now. The sun is shining, which you probably kind of tell when um, the sun is not shining. Uh, our kitchen gets pretty uh, dim. We have a skylight directly above us, but the snow is melting. We had snow was it the day after Thanksgiving. Yeah, so about the- four inches. This, there's two snow forts in our front yard that the Zeb and the boys built, and uh, they're starting to melt. So that's how our weather is. So is that normal to get snow before Thanksgiving or around uh, Thanksgiving? So it's in October. Like sometimes, like mid-October, you could, it could snow anytime. Yeah, once we start freezing, which is pretty much beginning to the middle of October, we start freezing pretty much every night consistently. At that point, we can get snow whenever. In the mountains, I mean, it could be June. It'll snow in the mountains. Yeah. So, Well, here in North Carolina... It is sunny, blue sky. There's not a cloud in the sky today, and it's around 44 degrees. So that's, that's actually pretty chilly for us. Our, my ideal uh, winter is a, definitely a spot of snow here and there, but really temperatures around 50, 60 de- degrees. And uh, we do get a lot of that in, in North Carolina, and we get very little snow. So... Um, if we don't get much snow, we'll just keep our eyes on your videos and enjoy the snow through you guys. <laughs> my, my ideal weather is California. And so we usually wind up Southern California. Southern she California. should specify. <laughs> yeah, I, we usually make at least one or two trips out there. Luckily, we have a, a friend in the paint business, so we can always make it a work trip. But we always plan a trip January, February, because I, I got to get out of the cold weather. So. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds nice. That's like a lot of people in this area head to Florida, yeah, right? Same thing. So they go well, to Florida. I was going to say 50 degrees, yeah. if that's like your average, that's still golfing weather. <laughs> that's right. We, we have no reason to complain, <laughs> that's for sure. Well, Jamie and Zeb, what I'd like to do is to have you guys share sort of a 30,000 foot view um, of your upcycling business. And you, if, you, if it helps, you could just kind of take us through just, just generally speaking a week. Like what's a week look like for you guys? And I know for those that follow you, they could probably answer the question uh, for uh, you. We're pretty scheduled, so that's actually not too hard. Yeah. We start off every Monday morning. We go to the thrift store every Monday morning. Um, and we will hit one to maybe four different thrift stores, depending on how much we can accumulate in that particular trip. Depending on how, how much goodies we find or how many goodies we find. Because sometimes, you know, when you're thrifting, you're at the mercy of what's in the store. Yeah. So. 
you know, sometimes we find amazing things and sometimes we're like, well, we got to go to like eight other stores today. And it's cyclical, like the summertime, at least here in Utah, like summertime, people are de junking cleaning out their garage, getting ready for fall because everybody has to clean out their stuff before winter. So really it's just like a lot of tonnage. So we can hit one store and done. Now we're getting into where it's getting colder um, and people aren't really cleaning out as much and they're busy shopping. And so the pickings are a little bit more slim. So we have to hit up more thrift stores. Um, and then to hit January, like January is, that's prime. Like everybody's like, let me clean up all your junk. And I'm like, bring it to me. Let me have it. Everybody's setting New Year's <laughs> resolutions and cleaning their house and de-junking and, and changing out their decor for something they may think they want new for the trend that year. And we're like, well, we'll take your old stuff. Bring yeah. it on over. So, so Mondays, Monday's thrifting day. We, our thrifting video goes up. Um, we actually, uh, we have a shop, but the shop is pretty full and we do a lot of online sales. So like the back end part of the shop, they're shipping and stuff. So we actually process all of the thrifted items here. So we unload everything out of the car on Monday, uh, midday afternoon onto our giant farm table in our dining room. Um, we finish up that video and then I have this little spot in the corner of my dining room that has like white ship lap in the back. It's pretty neutral. And I, in about 30 minutes, can photograph 50 items. And I just go from the farm table to the photograph spot to my church pew bench and it rotates through. And then while I'm um, editing my video, Zeb takes everything and puts it in the garage and it actually will sit there until we do our Saturday thrift haul video. And that's always for like the next week. And then once we get that done, anything that we have from the previous week from that Saturday video goes into our car and gets dropped off at the shop. It's already in the computer. So anything that's sold gets shipped and anything that's not sold is already in the computer because I upload it every week. Um, and the gals will tag it and put it into our retail store and kind of like stage that up. And then that's like our basic Monday. And then Tuesday, <laughs> yeah, that's Wednesday. Just that's a lot of shuffling around. Yeah, it's a lot of shuffling. That's, Tuesday, that's Wednesday, right. we paint anything <laughs> that we purchased the previous week that needs to be painted. And typically by Thursday, we will drop off everything that has been painted to the shop. Um, and then we will usually pick one or two pieces of furniture and do a video on painting that furniture. Um, and then get that into the shop. And so every week we have fresh thrift finds, we have freshly painted stuff, and usually a piece of furniture um, that's new into the shop. And that just helps keep inventory rolling. It also kind of controls us from being hoarders because anybody that's been in the thrifting world knows that it's real easy to shop. It's not so easy to rotate through your items and stay on top of painting. And every now and then we get backlogged. Yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of why we created uh, our Waste Not Wednesday video is because we would just get start getting piles of things in the garage that a, either needed a lot of repair that we couldn't just do quick on a video or they needed uh, some special attention. And most of the time we get these things for free. Sometimes it's like scrap wood in the garage, but we take them and on the Waste Not Wednesday video, we do makeover, show the repairs, show how we fix it up. And then that also serves two purposes. It gets a lot of stuff out of our garage and we get an extra video out of it. It's a, it's a fun live stream every Wednesday morning that we do. Yeah, our content is really just whatever we happen to be doing for our business and our life. If we have too much furniture in the shop um, and we need to create a furniture painting video, that's when we'll paint something for our own home like if our kids need something or whatever. So there's always there's always something that needs to be painted and flipped. We actually have, do you want to see some unpainted thrifted items? We have some unpainted ones. Yeah, yeah, hold hold, hold <laughs> off because we'll, we'll get to that. I'm eager to see that stuff. But, you know, I guess the thing that comes to my mind when hearing you guys talk about just the course of a week, who among you, out of the two of you, is the administrative one? I mean, as far as this or systems-minded person who's like, okay, we have to have a system or did this just develop? Oh, so Jane, Jane. kind of, you know, she, she gets her mama hen out and, and, you know, she just takes care of everything all week. I'm the budget guy. Yeah, <laughs> I'm the one that's like, Hey, we can't do that this week. <laughs> I mean, I feel like it's both of us. Zeb used to work at discount tires. So as far as like systems and like order of doing things, I mean, that's kind of your strong point. I, I actually have, um, I, I like to call it, it's like functional ADHD. I have to be always be doing something different all the time. And so he is very like one track, like we're going to do this, this, and this. And then in my mind, I break things up into smaller tasks. And then like combined, it just kind of works. I don't know. Like we never really set out to do it that way, but it just kind of has happened. And starting in like, was it January, December last year? I started, I started editing the videos. And when I started editing the videos, that's when we really got on a very like 
good schedule of stuff because it's just it like had to make sense in my well, mind. Well, what was happening is I would um, I, I focus on like our longer term projects. Example, we had the flooring that we just finished here in the kitchen over Thanksgiving break. So it just got done like yesterday. Uh, and Jamie's doing like 30 other things in the background and I'm able to just focus on the flooring and get that done. Likewise, when we got our shop, I was over there a lot of the time. Jamie was running most of the business and I'm doing things like, you know, pulling the ceiling out and repainting the whole thing and moving walls and stuff like that at our new shop that we got two, I guess it's been two years ago now, but so we, it's kind of a, it's like a ballet and we've, we've gotten pretty good at it. We've been doing it together full time for eight and a half years now. So, and it's changed a lot over the years. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, it's, it's, our life has changed. I find it so fascinating how, um, just the gifts that, that people have. And when you have your own business, when you have that entrepreneurial spirit, you get, especially a husband and wife come together, like what that, that balance, like, so that you both are not like, you know, feeding out of the same trough in the sense of like your talent so that you, you really balance one another. Well, and it sounds like you guys do that. I mean, Zeb, if you're the budget guy, does that mean Jamie's, uh, like has to be like harnessed at times on like spending or she very no, he's a spender. I'm, I'm usually an enabler. So Jamie in the back uh, of her okay. mind, like she's the one that like, <laughs> let's say we were going to get something new that we wanted to carry in the shop that we're going to not produce ourselves uh, and that we're going to wholesale. She'll find it, source it. And then she'll buy like five of them and I'll see it. And I'm like, um, that's going to sell fast. You should have got 30. You know, so <laughs> well, and like when we travel, like when we go to England and we do our thrifting and junking in England, he's always the one like, when are you ever going to find this again? We already paid all this money to get here. Like, I'm like, let's buy six copper tea kettles. And he's like, let's buy 30 copper. So he definitely doesn't like I, I'm not a I mean, our budget isn't without a ceiling. Like we definitely have some constraints we have to stay within. But when you're thrifting things, um, a lot of times we're finding this stuff for a dollar, two dollars. So 50 items could could be like $100 worth of stuff. So in that aspect, we were like, sky's the limit, you know, buy what you want. When you think of retail businesses, how much they spend on inventory, we're so much less than that in a lot of things that we're doing. A lot of it's because we're actually putting our energy into it and flipping it and painting it. But um, I buy a lot of wholesale items and I'm always shocked at how you can rack up $400 in just a couple boxes. If I spend $400 at the thrift store, that's like tables and tables and tables of stuff, you know? Yeah, that's cool that you've got experience from both worlds and then you can see the, the difference in the cost. And and so that's interesting too. Zeb is actually thinking budget when he says, let's buy 30 of those because he knows that he's gonna make uh, some good margins on those yeah. 30, right? Trying to help no. you out there, Well, no, Zeb. time is money too. <laughs> like you're already spending the time, so you might as well make the money. And I think yeah. with us, we have had very lean times and we've had times where things have gone really well. And so if we do have a month where we have unexpected expenses or whatever, neither one of us is opposed to saying, okay, we are not going to spend any extra money. Like I think coming from a, like my business was literally started with five bucks. Like the first thing I ever bought was $5 and I just kept, you know, where you trade that in for something a little more, a little more, a little more. And that's how it grew. I think when you come from that, it, you know how to stretch a dollar when necessary. So when things happen and we do need to like curtail the budget, we just, it's not a problem. We you, just stop spending. Money. You can always tell if our budget's gotten tight. Like we spent a lot on like uh, renovation of the shop that last, I guess it was a year and a half ago. And so January that following year, we are like, okay, we got to tighten things up. This is what we have to work with. And we actually went to a lot of less, less wholesale type items and more things we produce ourselves, which, you know, we have to work more when we do that. We have a lot less free time, but it also frees up that budget. It's like one of those sacrifices you have to make, especially as a small business owner. Sometimes you got to do, you got to get your, uh, hands dirty and do a lot of the work yourself. Um, so we have like a CNC machine that we've invested in and we can do a lot of things with that. And, and uh, we do printing on the side for a decoupage line. You know, it's, it's we do a lot of different things. Zeb thinks he can do everything himself. Wow. Sometimes I'm like, I'm not sure I want to do that. <laughs> that sounds a little too tiring. <laughs> Listen, so I, I have this question because this fascinates me as well. So knowing what you guys are doing today, um, and you said, I think I heard you say you've been doing this for about eight years. 
Yeah, he, so eight, he's eight been doing half. it for eight and a half years. I have been, I started about three years before him. I mean, okay. the first time I ever sold anything I painted was probably 20 years ago, but like more like a business, it's probably been 11, 11 years. Gotcha. So, so, so what were you guys doing? Let's, let's back up all the way before those 11 years. So what were you both doing? Like, what was your, uh, two questions. What were you doing? And at that time, if you could project forward, would you go, there is no way I'm going to be doing that? Or, yeah, I could see myself doing that. So I, so right out of high school, uh, we, we got married pretty fast. We were high school sweethearts. And I had been working at Discount Tire part-time through high school and you know that i was like i was going to be a career guy there i did go to school for like at a community college where we lived in arizona at the time for uh almost two years um in between all of that and i did graphic design and art was my focus um but wasn't paying any of the bills jamie was working like crazy doing her stuff we were both working and we had two kids early on and we were putting them into daycare and Jamie's like, I'm, I'm not going to do this my whole life. So I went back to work after trying school for a couple of years, um, went full time with Discount Tire and did that for 15 years. Uh, and then we, uh, you know, and then from there I started doing it with her. But, you know, that's kind of my work background. Uh, and then she can probably tell you more about what she's doing. She, she wears all the hats as far as, uh, you know, what she's done. <laughs> so I, I, I started in the mortgage industry at 19 years old and worked my way up in that. And I was like, not to toot my own home, but I was pretty good at it, but I, it didn't, I've always been a creator. I've always been creative and like to get my hands dirty. And, um, it was really stressful. And it, but the thing is it made a lot of money. So like when he says he was going to school, like he didn't work for a couple of years, he stayed home with our kids and I was a mortgage loan officer. And like you said, one day I was like, I am not going to be the sole provider for the rest of our married life. Like, I just don't <laughs> see this working well. I don't see it working well for you. Well, and that's I wasn't, when went back. I was not a very good uh, housekeeper. Um, <laughs> you know, I was home with the kids and we were all alive and, you know, we ate most of the time and, you know, so things were happening. Schoolwork was getting done, but you know, Jamie would come home and she'd be like, "Hey, what's for dinner?" I've been working all day, and I'd be like, um, "We got a box of macaroni and cheese. You probably whip that out for yourself pretty quick." <laughs> the kid Odelia would still be in her pajamas. I mean, that was just. I mean, we were also very, very young too, like nineteen, twenty. I mean, well, at that point, yes, we were like twenty three, yeah. twenty four. <laughs> I don't know. We were. We got married. I was eighteen when we got married. Anyways, young. Let's just say figuring out our life. I feel like we grew up together with our kids. Um, and then we moved to Utah. He was still working for Discount Tire. I was doing uh, mortgages from home. I actually ran an in-home daycare for a while. And actually, when he finally um, stopped working at Discount Tire, I was doing part-time daycare, running Jamie Ray Vintage, which was blowing up. It was crazy. Like, we don't have time to talk about all the things that were going on, but it was just like growing up. I took over another business. I started doing markets. And then I was also um, fairly full-time doing... Uh, pre-mortgage underwriting from home. So everything I did was from home, but I had three different revenue sources. And actually when he quit his job, I actually worked for another three or four months, kind of closing up loose ends with the other businesses that I um, ran in addition to Jamie Ray Vintage. But when he, we finally made that choice for him to stop doing um, tires and come to work with me, I was to the point with Jamie Ray Vintage where it was hire Zeb or, or hire somebody else. Like I could no longer... Um, handled the flipping business on my own. We were putting together, like I said, we're doing big markets where thousands of people would come a few times a year. And that was always like a lot of work to do by myself. And I had a, a lot of work. <laughs> Jack was born a year before he quit his job. So as my business was growing, like blowing up like crazy, we had five children and my youngest was a newborn. So Jack was 11 months old when he quit his job. So it was just insane. Like I remember being at markets and I was in charge of the market and Zeb would bring Jack to me and I would just like sit there and sell stuff while I was nursing a baby under a poncho. <laughs> like <laughs> when people talk about how busy we are now, I'm like, it's nothing compared it's to how busy we were when busy. all our kids were, were little. <laughs> they all grew up around uh, thrift flipping. We, yeah. I, people always ask me like, how do they stay out of your paint? And I'm like, cause they grew up around it. We've had a paint cabinet in our house forever and my kids are naughty. They get into lots of things, but I have never had to clean up 
them getting into my paint cabinet. No, and they also don't touch wet paint. paint. The dogs, <laughs> my dogs touch wet paint, but the kids, like even 18 months old, they knew what wet paint was and they didn't touch it. So it's so cool to hear this because when I hear you talk about Zeb, your background and Jamie, your background, no wonder you guys are, are such a success because you didn't really step out of your comfort zones as far as like what you're good at doing. I mean, Zeb, you're, you're doing a lot of the uh, refurbishing upcycling as well. And so you've got that background, graphic design and art, which, cause that was one of, that was one of my questions I was going to ask is like, it was this hard for you to get into this like upcycling. I know it's not graphic design per se, but it's still the creative element of the talent that you have within you. So was that a bit of a challenge stepping out, you know, into the upcycling aspect? So if we step back even farther, when I was a kid growing up, uh, my mom, I mean, I spent my childhood diving in and out of thrift stores and antique stores and yard sales. When Jamie met me, I was wearing a shirt that I had gotten from a yard sale that was probably from the 70s, uh, you know, and that was in high school. So it kind of was a really natural progression. I mean, my parents are big DIYers. Uh, and that's an understatement. Yeah. Like, they, they, my dad built like three of the homes I lived in growing up and my mom was right there helping him and huge gardens and things like that. So to come into and, and, and the kids, we were I'm the oldest of six. We would all just right there with them, you know, uh, doing all these projects with my parents. So to to do this is like, you know, this is second nature almost. It's just fun. It's what I did growing up. You know, <laughs> I, I was such a crafty mess that I like. I'm thinking when we moved into our house in California, I was like six and my dad was a housing developer. So he's a general contractor. He built houses. And when he built our house, he put uh, vinyl, like the flooring in my bedroom instead of carpet, because my mom knew that like, there is no way carpet was ever going to survive. Like I had a dining craft table and they put vinyl in my room like ahead of time because I've been painting and crafting like my whole entire life. And Zeb, when he was in high school, always did like did really well in art class. And he would draw me things and do like colored pencil art for me and take it home. I think I painted my first uh, piece of furniture when I was like 13. So while that wasn't necessarily what we were doing for a living, a creative lifestyle and creating things has been always part of our lives. And then when we got married, you know, you have like zero dollars. So <laughs> you have to figure out how to yard sale and thrift and paint stuff to make your house look cute. So it's well, yeah. we had uh, our first apartment we lived in. Jamie went and got a couch from the Goodwill <laughs> and brought it home. I was still at work. And then my, by the time I got home, her and my mom had, had it, were already reupholstering it. Really? Yeah. So. Wow. That, that's, that's thrifty. <laughs> that's and I tell you what, the, like you just hit the nail on the head how much money you save by having those gifts and being able to have the right eye to know what to get and then how to upcycle it so that it's something that is unique and well, desirable for your home. We did a lot of really ugly stuff too. Like don't, don't think that we just like, <laughs> you learned the hard way. <laughs> like I, I look back, I used to redecorate my room like every year. And I look back at some of my like design schemes, like thank goodness there wasn't social media back then because there's some things that I did that I probably don't want anybody else to see. So <laughs> isn't that funny? Isn't that funny though? Like my, my daughter, we have three, um, three kids. My uh, middle uh, daughter is 18 and um, probably about six years ago, maybe it was longer than that. Maybe about eight years ago, we painted her room, this like bright green. It was like um, almost a neon green. <laughs> And she's like, why did we do that? I'm like, well, if you recall, you liked it. <laughs> so it was something. And I remember when we got it done and we were like, you know what? This is nice. What a nice room. But it didn't last very long, probably about a year and a half to two years when it totally changed directions. But it is just funny how at that time when you do something, most of the time you look at it and you're like, oh, nice. It's just it doesn't stay with you very long because your styles change or you see something better. Or you just get better at what you're doing. I think a lot of people will see where we're at now and be like, I could never do that. How do they know how to make this look so good? They make it look easy. And it's not that it's easy. It's just we've been doing it for a really long time. We've painted thousands of pieces. I mean, it be, especially since we started doing like thrift flipping, yeah. we can do 20 <laughs> pieces in a week. No problem. Like it's just normal. When you do that much, you learn what works, what doesn't work. Um, and mm -hmm. you 
it's like with any skill, you learn how to design things. And while we're not interior designers by any means, we spend a lot of time uh, like looking at design books and visit, going to Pinterest or- My uh, favorite's when we go over to Europe and you actually see like the old architecture and how they've just repaired things for hundreds of years. And you go in there and they've got a table that's you know being held together by 18 various different like repairs that they've done. Uh, and they're still using it and it's from the 1800s or the 1700s. And, you know, I, I, that's my favorite thing. Yeah. If you go to Europe and you tell them, oh, I have an old house. My house is built in 1917. They'll look at you and be like, that's not old. Like, why would you <laughs> think 1917's you. old? And, and they don't just throw things away. They're very much like reusing and redoing yeah. and allowing the imperfections to shine. I feel like we live in this um, society where when somebody goes in, like you watch those like house flipping sh shows and they'll like come in and flip a house and then it looks like a track home, like brand new. And whereas you go to Europe and while they do upgrade certain things, they also are not afraid of imperfections. And in the end, that's why everything they have is so charming because they've allowed for imperfections and not just came in and completely like made it look generic. Like they'll leave things. If that doesn't line up just right, it's okay. You know, and so I think that's a lot of what we do is we tell people like beauty is in the imperfections. That's that human element in the things. And some people just want to paint something and they want it to look exactly brand new, like they bought it off the shelf. And that's that's not what we create. Yeah. Well, so let's talk shop. So you mentioned it's been about a year and a half, two years since you now was this your first shop ever? No, it's just the first one we've owned. Yeah. So uh, when we originally opened up a shop, we kind of stumbled on it and we were just leasing a room uh, in the back of someone else's shop, almost almost like uh, consignment, uh, similar. And then we, we kind of grew from there. And then that person actually was like, hey, I want out of the business. We took the whole shop over a couple of years after that. And then we were like, you know what, we, we really want to, our, our shop was like up for sale where we were leasing at and we tried to buy that and that fell out from underneath us. And so we had a new landlord that we were dealing with and we're like, you know what, we need to find somewhere new that's ours that we can change and, you know, do some architectural things and structural things to the building to make it our own. Um, and that's when we found this place we're at now. It's a oldest church in Utah County that's still standing as built in 1894. Uh, and it was a residence for 60 years. It wasn't even on the market. Like yeah. <laughs> our, the building we're in kind of got sold out from underneath us. And I was really sad about that because I had all these dreams of making it better. It, and it's a cool old, like our first shop was in an old red brick house, probably built in what the 40s? No, I think 1940s. Yeah. yeah 1940s. Um, and then one day I told Deb, like, I think we should, by that church. And he's like, the church, it's, it's not for sale. Somebody lives there. Like, what do you mean? And I was like, well, I feel like we're supposed to like, we're supposed to buy it. I don't want to tell you. And so we yes. got a hold of him and he's like, actually I would sell it. And it took a really long time. Like we approached him in February. We didn't close until like the following October. October. And then we didn't move in until the following August. And there was a lot of, you know, things in between figuring out how to do a commercial loan. And it was only partially zoned commercial. So we had to go to the city and change the zoning. We had no idea how to do that. <laughs> but I feel like with business, it's not about knowing all the answers. It's about knowing to keep working until you find the answers and not willing to give up. So you can do pretty much anything as long as you're willing to ask questions. And I remember walking into the city and being like, I have no idea what I'm doing, but um, I'm going to buy this and I need you to tell me what to do. And they did. This is what we need. How do we do that? Yeah. How do I do this? <laughs> yeah. Just be open and transparent. I need help. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing when we were doing the commercial loan, like we told the commercial lender, we have no idea. Yeah, Her background's in mortgages and she's like, I don't know what I'm yeah, doing. Commercial here. lending is like the wild, wild west. It is not like traditional mortgage lending at all. In fact, until the day we closed, I had no clue that it was like, I was like, I hope it's going to close. I don't know, <laughs> because there weren't like fast and furious guidelines. We went with a very small bank and it was more like how they feel about us, how our business is growing. It wasn't like you have to make X amount of dollars and, and there's like these strict matrices. That's how you do residential lending. It was not like that at all. It was crazy. How far is the shop from your home? Um, it's in the same city. We don't tell people how far it is just because we don't like people know exactly where we live, but it's within 10 minutes of our house. Okay. That's it's, good. It's I, I just was, <laughs> yeah, I was curious in if it, if it added a, an extra stress level because of distance, but oh, if it's yeah. close, that's a huge plus. So what did the shop do for you guys? I mean, hopefully it's financially um, uh, profitable for you, but I'm saying as far as 
did you, do you find that it added a significant level of stress or did it actually alleviate some of the stress by having an outlet and a place to, um, to go and sort of make your own and to uh, customize it and to also have a place, a, it looks like a large, it looks like a large, uh, pretty good sized shop. Yeah, it's 5,000 square feet. The showroom area is about 1,800. And then the rest of that is storage or we do shipping out of the back. As far as stress goes, to answer your question about that, I feel like it was kind of double edged sword. It was a stress to get it to a point where we could use it like a commercial building um, and all the renovations that had to happen there, but also a relief because we were starting to be like, hey, we need to get a storage unit or we're going to have to rent like a warehouse or something just to keep inventory. And this building was big enough that we can keep all of our online inventory there. And we do we do have some local people that come in. Like I said, we keep like a showroom up front where most of our inventory is actually kept. But, you know, it's it's really nice to have that space where we can ship out of because 90% of our business is actually online. Yeah, I, so I, I think I have a little bit different perspective. I think owning a store is a lot of work. Um, it takes it up a lot of time, but nothing worth having um, – isn't going to be a significant amount of work. Like you, you see the benefits of it, but there's all the, the things that go behind it. But the thing about the shop is like when it's right, it's right. And definitely the shop has been right for us. Uh, when we were looking for a space, when our, like when our building had been sold out from underneath us and we had a new landlord and the rent was going to go up, um, we looked around and there was not one commercial building in our entire town that was for sale that we could A, afford, and B, fit our design aesthetic. They were all just very generic or uh, very like commercialized. Like warehouse type and buildings. it was really important to us to stay within our brand. And so this church shop is 100% on brand for us. It's a fixer-upper. It's historic. It has charm. And it was also really important was we have five kids. They are all, well, I have two of them are adult now, but... When we were doing all this, they were all busy. We've got football players and cheerleaders and wrestlers, and we are constantly going back and forth from the high school to our house, to our shop. Um, and so there's no way we could run this business if we had to drive half an hour or have any real kind of commute. Like it, our life is very triangulated. We have our house, we have our shop, we have our kids school, and we can go to anything and be anywhere we need to be in under 10 minutes. And that was huge. So when you have like even smaller boundaries because you've got to run a family as well, I feel like the shop is perfect in that department. And there's this huge garage that we call the barn um, <laughs> that has uh, been amazing for storage. It's got Zeb's tools. It's got my um, my thrift flips Your that we haven't got army. to. My chair army. We also have, it's about on half an acre. And so we keep our chickens at the shop. We grow a huge garden in the back because we don't have that much space where our house is. So we're able to use it that way. And we're actually currently remodeling this little cottage in the back. So we're remodeling that cottage to turn it into an Airbnb. Um, and I don't even think we thought about that when we bought it, but no. now it's there and it's such a great like place for us to create and um, it's content for our, our YouTube channel. I mean, just never ending content between our house and our shop. So I feel like it works for us. Is it stressful? Oh yeah. It's stressful. I well, mean, a lot of that stress, I think, is more on Jamie because if it doesn't look just a certain way, or if it's not just right, no one's <laughs> like, "Hey, Zeb, you really missed the perfectionist." The on that one, like, like you, you, no one, no one blames me for if something doesn't look right or go the right way. It's her name on the the company name, right? So she's she, you know, we're we're a partnership, but a lot of it does fall on her to like have a certain aesthetic or a look. I'm just this dude in the background repairing furniture. <laughs> I, that is not the case at all. But it, very it, modest, does, it does work out well. It's been a huge blessing to us. Like I can't, I can't deny it. I, I thought that we would have more local traffic, but I just think the world is different now. People it, do a lot online. They do a lot of online shopping and it gives us a beautiful place to film and show people our wares and all the items that we thrift and make over look a thousand times prettier in the setting of this old um, antique church that we've renovated. Yeah, that's a beautiful place. In fact, I enjoyed uh, some of the construction uh, that uh, that you guys went through to get it to where it's at today. I know it was a lot of work. And I <laughs> believe your bad. dad, your dad passed away not too long ago. Am I correct, Jamie? Yeah, so he, my dad passed away September 8th, uh, 2022. It's actually my 40th birthday. 
And it was a week before our grand opening. And he worked side by side with Zeb and I, not just in renovating the home that we live in, because we live in a, a 1917 home that we gutted ourselves, but he also helped um, pull together the the church. We have video of him a week before he passed, yeah. helping build a display. I've and seen he that. loved construction and he loved being Zeb's buddy. And so there's so much of, of him in there. And so it's a great kind of legacy that, that I get to enjoy every day. Yeah. And it's neat that he was a part of it, um, that, uh, that he lived to, to see that kind of come to fruition. Do you, um, speaking of the shop itself, do you love it as much as you thought you would or more so? Do you want to answer that? I do love it. I probably more so than I thought it would because so we we moved up to Lehigh in 2007 from Arizona and we've been driving past this building on State Street and you know the nostalgia of my youth going to all these old places and antique shops and my parents always wanted to fix up like an old school or a church you know so we we'd do that when I was a kid too and I just drive by it on State Street I mean weekly if not daily and see it just sitting there. And I'm like, I wonder who lives in there. I wonder what they're doing with that building. It doesn't look like they're doing anything with it. Um, and now that it's ours, it's like, I can't even believe that this is real. Like we have a place to, we actually currently, I mean, she's still back there. We have a cow, a milk cow in the back, you know? <laughs> so, and our chickens and Jamie mentioned our garden and uh, you know, we've got big plans for the grounds cause it's on half an acre, but uh, it's, and it's going to be a slow process to get that done. Lots of work, but I actually love the work. So that, that's also beneficial. I think for me, like, I didn't know I was going to love it because I didn't know I was going to have it. Like, I, I think our, a lot of people ask us, do you, know, did you plan out your business so that way you would end up where you're at? And everything that's ever happened to us business wise has kind of just, happen. It's not like we didn't put work into it beforehand to get into the position where we were ready for it. But like when Zeb quit his job, it happened because he'd been passed over for a promotion like three times in a year and we had had it. And I was like, that's it. If they're not going to promote you, I definitely know that we can use you and make this into something amazing. And I need you and I want you. If they're not going to want you, I want you. Um, when we started renting that little booth space, and I drove by, I had never even set foot into the store. And I just felt like I was supposed to have a space there. In fact, with the day I signed my contract was the first time I ever set foot. Same thing <laughs> with when we bought this house that we live in. My friend is a real estate agent. She's like, just humor me. Just humor me oh, and the come house see this inspection house. on this. I'm like, good thing I'm <laughs> gutting this because that's the only way this is going to work. <laughs> well, as soon as we stepped foot in it, I was like, I feel like this is where we're supposed to live. So we bought this house by the skin of our teeth. Like, barely qualified because that was back when we were still building our business. Well, we'd been self-employed at that point for what, five years? Yeah. Four and, and a half we years. We were finally to the point where we weren't paying bills. And so we self-employment is, you know, getting a loan when you're self-employed and verifying income. It's always tricky. And so like to buy this house was like a huge step. And, you know, that actually was a huge launching point because we refinanced it and used that as a down payment on yeah, the shop. If we, had not, <laughs> if we had not done all the work we did here, we wouldn't have had the money to pull out for the for the shop. And we didn't know when we were doing this that that was going to happen. And same thing, like we bought this in 2019. One month later, we found out our shop owner that we had rented space from was getting out of the business. And I was like, but we can't we can't open a shop like we've, we've got a house to renovate. We just bought a very much a fixer upper. But we didn't have a choice. Like she was leaving and we had to have somewhere to sell our wares. And so we took over a shop. So it's never like we planned to have a shop. And the same thing with buying this commercial building. Like we weren't planning on buying it, but our building basically got sold out from underneath us. And it was either buy a new building or be stuck paying like our rent was going to almost double. And it just we were outgrowing the space and we needed a new place. So it's just kind of we've grown and our business has grown. And as opportunities have come up. When it felt right, we just we just did it. So I got to ask this question: How many chickens do you have? Uh, does a woman know how many chickens she has? I don't know. <laughs> we have twenty-two. We have twenty-two. We have twenty. Okay. Twenty-one hens and Fred. Okay. We're to have so, all hens, so one... but Fred came as best friend. Yeah. Did. Chickens so coming though. I think we have you beat. Uh, and you said, "Does a woman know how many chickens she has?" I think my wife could pretty much always keep track of those chickens because she's we have 23 i believe oh nice that's you know uh, and, you get no over rooster. like 10 you have a lot <laughs> yes yeah but you know the neat thing about it is that 
those fresh eggs, once you um, get a taste of fresh farm eggs, it's hard to, to do. It's hard to go back to grocery store uh, eggs, and and also it's a lot of fun to be able to share them with with uh, neighbors and family as well. Yeah. So that's cool that you've got those chickens. Well, and chickens so are, are you... crazy. If you need entertainment, just go hang out with your chickens for a minute. <laughs> exactly. Isn't that funny? They're so fun to go watch. They're like little dinosaurs. <laughs> They're crazy to watch. So um, let's dive into thrifting. So you guys, as mentioned earlier, you go out each week, twice a week, and you go to these thrift stores. You each get your shopping cart and you start pulling things in into the cart. So how do you know what to look for? And, and let me ask you this, and can this be learned? And if so, help us, <laughs> give, <laughs> give us some guidance here, because what you guys do uh, looks in, in many respects, probably because of the size of, in which you do it and the intensity of, of what you do, having a full-time business, it seems very overwhelming. Uh, but, but trying, cause uh, trying to narrow it down to people who are probably just wanting to learn how to thrift for themselves and maybe they're interested in having uh, a business, but what, what can you do to help us? Tell us about that process and how do you know what to get and what to pass by? I think we have two very different approaches. I'll tell you my approach. Um, one of the things I like to do is I like to look at design books. And so I have been browsing country living, uh, coffee table design books, Pinterest for a lot of years. And so I just um, commit the things that I love to memory. And I don't know how to explain this. Like, it's kind of a, probably a weird concept, but I will look at a, a room the way it's decorated, but then I dissect, okay, these are the parts of the room that make it look good. And I just log that away. So when I'm thrifting, I'm like, oh, I've seen this used this way. I've seen this used. I've seen a vignette where they had these books with this vase and they had this in the background. Because a lot of times when you look at a, a design magazine, it looks very effortless. And I can tell you that design <laughs> is not effortless. There's great effort that goes in. And a truly well-designed, curated room is going to have so many different interesting things in it that you can't just go out to your standard retail store and buy. They're curated over time. And so after years and years of that, I just know what I like to, to buy and anything I think I can use to create a certain aesthetic. Um, and then we show people how to use them. So like I will buy it and then I'll say, this is how I use it in my home. This is how I use it in my shop. And so that kind of helps connect the dots for, for my customers. Um, and then the other thing when I'm looking at like, here, we're gonna bring something on camera here. So, this to me is dated and dark and ugly, but what I'm looking at it is the shape. What is it made of? And if this was a different color and texture, could it be something that would look good for decorating? So I'm thinking, what can I do with this to make it look better? So Zeb's got a few things on the other side. Here, let me Here. let me show you. What can we do? So a lot of <laughs> a lot of way I thrift while we're showing this. So this this was red and black, and not a good red or a good black combo, like dingy, crusty. Mm -hmm. And we just brightened it up, made it a little more uh, not necessarily modern, but the neutral color can go pretty much with anything. And a lot of times, if it's got good bones, it's kind of like a house. Maybe sometimes it just needs a new paint job, and it could be amazing and the showpiece on the street. Same with furniture and thrifting. You know, sometimes you just give it a little paint on there or a little texture or, you know, change the design up a little bit. And now you've got like this fun urn that could be used as a planter or you can hide your spare change in there, your keys, whatever it is. Um, so that when I'm thrifting, that's what I'm looking for. Like, what can it be? What can I turn that into? Um, or if it's like a bigger piece of furniture, sometimes you find stuff at the thrift store that's pretty broken. But I'm like, okay, those drawers are pretty awesome. What can we do with those drawers? Can we make shelves out of them? Can we use them for components in another dresser that I've got that's broken and make those two come together? So that's what I'm looking for when I'm thrifting um, is what, what can it be and what can I use the parts for? Well, and I think we started really doing this kind of thrift because to me, when I look at this, I think this looks like something that you would probably find somewhere like an old worn urn that you might find in an antique store. And when you go to the thrift store, if there is something that is really good as is, 
you got to get in there. You got to be quick. You got to pull it before some other thrifter gets it. And sometimes you go and there's nothing. And so we've kind of learned to go and say, okay, there's nothing, but what actually is there that we can make into something? Because we have to buy a certain amount of volume. And sometimes it's just not there. Like, I don't know where these people go and they get all this awesome stuff they don't need to paint, but our thrift stores are not full of awesome stuff as is. So we've kind of had to think outside the box. Okay, what can we turn this into? Um, so we're not spending every day thrifting because you could, I guess you could go to the thrift store every day and go all up and down. We have, we call it the, the I-15, the freeway. We could go to probably 50 thrift stores a week, oh, but who yeah. has time for that? Mm. Yeah. So that, that specific urn, Zab, what did you, you said you painted and you said it was red and black. Did you, did you add a texture to it? So it or this like one was lucky. It already had a texture. We do use a lot of texture medium though with mm -hmm. the paints that could get this look on just something that was like slick and shiny. Uh, but this one was good to go. So that, that's another thing, another tip, I guess, when you're out there thrifting, what's it made out of? Wood, uh, metal, uh, uh, glass, uh, what is ceramics, what? terracotta, avoid things like plasticky things or artificial like fiberboard type stuff. If you, if you can avoid that, you're going to be miles ahead already because if you go to a thrift store and you're buying a dresser from the 40s or the 50s, there's a high chance that most of that is made out of oak or maple or something that's still valuable as a material, even if you're not going to use it as a dresser. You can make a hundred signs out of a dresser, you know? Well, also think about the color that it is to begin with, because no matter how hard you try, whatever <laughs> that base color is, chances are it's going to peek through. Some will come back. I like to find dark things. You want to bring in that there's like that candlestick or that's that'll be fine. Here, we'll show we'll show this. Yeah. So like this candlestick was paint plain black, but it was hand carved, but you couldn't see in it because it was solid black. So it was like super boring. But I know that because it's got detail and because it's black, it's a really good candidate. I don't know if you can push it up a little bit closer um, to layer on a couple of different paint colors and then bring back that original paint color. So rather than working against it, I'm like, okay, here's a dark color. That's going to be a really great base coat. And then I don't have to do a base coat and I can just dress back to it and layer it. And then all of this detail that was just blah, like the candlestick itself is super boring. Now is all popping because I've layered paint on it. So I don't know that. Yeah, this is a hand carved wood made in India candlestick. Okay. Very nice. Yeah. It's amazing how you can uh, see something and have a vision uh, before it's completed to know what to do with it. Um, and I, I like you both kind of touched on the fact that um, you're looking at the shape of an item, because I think that is what's so distracting in a thrift store when you go in, especially when you see a lot of this stuff, maybe from the 70s and 80s and early 90s, that has so much design to it, so much color. And some of it's garish and some of it is just basically out of date. The 80s and 90s were not great for furniture. Or really, that's, you know, like 1995, right. early 2000s. Um, and I think it's also true, like what people also have to realize too, is you don't have to just go thrifting. Like a lot of people have things in their home that if they pull together, they could create an entirely new look just by grabbing a paintbrush, grabbing some paint, and then now giving it a cohesive finish. A lot of these here, you want to pull together what we yeah, did today. Yeah, so, so we actually did these this morning earlier. And these three things, four things were all different, different colors, different colors, different stuff. And it, now it kind of just, oh, five things now, all just goes together. Like you could put this in a room all together. And because you use paint, even though this is a different design than this, it really just flows and goes together because you, you made it match with the color. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it does. I, the, the color combination of everything is really nice. And so all of that, uh, you found it at thrift stores, correct? Yeah, I don't think we spent over, which was this, $3. So yeah. the most expensive item that we had, $3. Everything was under that here, did you see? Uh -huh. And now, if you went to a high-end store, you, you could you pay guys, 60 just for this. Yeah. So this is sort of a side question. But when you're working on stuff, let's say, for example, that urn, and you're like, this is nice. I really like this. Do you ever have issues with like, you know, this would look really good back there on the coffee table. <laughs> so we rotate. We, so Jamie, Jamie calls, uh, calls it, uh, 
uh, I, I forget the exact phrase she uses, but she basically, if she loves it, she'll keep it in the house for a while and then she'll, she'll pass it along. Like until when, you know, she'll. It's the circle of junk. You know, there you the go. That's what, it is. That's what I <laughs> couldn't you know. remember. The circle of junk. But like, <laughs> like we'll that. have it in our house for three, four years and then she'll, you know, change the room out or redo something. Cause we're always constantly in flux, like, you know, doing, cause it's what we do for a living. Um, so we're seeing new ideas or we see a design that we like, or we see something from 200 years ago. We're like, we need to make this look like that. I love that. Uh, and so the stuff that doesn't work with that in our home gets kicked out to the shop. It'll show up on the website or on the showroom at the shop. And well, we're not always ready for it. Yeah, like you ever see something it. you love, but you don't have somewhere to put it for us. It's so great because if we see something we love, we just put it in the shop and I figure, you know, if it sells, then it was meant to be. It, it, you know, it's going where it's meant to go. But for me, like whenever I'm designing a new room, instead of keeping all those things at my house, it's just all at the store. And I literally will go to my store and say, okay, I need this, 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 and this, just pull it off the shelf, take it out of inventory, use it. And when I'm ready to be done with it, put it back in inventory, grab something else, even seasonally, um, things that are sentimental, I'll keep year over year. But a lot of my seasonal decor, when I'm done with that season, I will box it up and it doesn't go on the floor, obviously, because the season's over, but I'll box it up and take it to the shop. And then that next year, when we're ready to set up for the season, a lot of the things that are in my shop were things that were in my home the year before, because we sell antique and used items. So it's no big deal if the blanket that I had this year on my couch is next year's inventory in the shop. So specifically, I mean, I guess, I guess materials is something I look for, but like also there's a few things that we always have our eye out oh, for. Yeah. Uh, rolling pins is one of those. This is just an old beat up, used up rolling pin. And most people are not out there like cranking out pies and making bread and doing all kinds of stuff with a rolling pin these days. So we, We'll paint the handles up. I stenciled this this morning. We painted it. Can it be used with food anymore? No, but now it looks really cool in your kitchen hanging out. You can hang this on the wall. We have people that do whole mm -hmm. collections of them because they're like a piece of art now. Yeah, we stamp them. We stencil them. And so we're always looking for that. Another like press tin, like this type of piece. When you're thrifting, I feel like this is money right here because this is so much texture that you can work with. And normally when you buy it, like you can kind of see the back. Like that's really boring. And that's what that's going to look like when you thrift it. But then when you paint it, it always looks good. So I'm always looking for pressed tin because that's, or embossed tin, whatever they call it, because it just looks really good. Um, I do find though, because we have a lot of local followers, when we're really into something, sometimes we can't find it for a long time because we'll show people how to make it over. And then our, our local followers will you know, frequent the same <laughs> thrift store. So we're always having to come up with something new. We went on a long rolling pin drought there this summer yeah. where we didn't find any for Did weeks you? on end. We found five last week yeah, all at once. Was, I was like, we hit the mother load. <laughs> we were so excited to find yeah, five rolling exactly. pins this week. <laughs> yeah. So uh, when you guys are shopping and you've each got your own cart, you bring everything back. Um, do you uh, keep what you buy for yourselves to fix yourself? I mean, that probably didn't say that well, but like Zeb, the stuff that you purchased. I get what you're saying. Are you guys mixing it so up or time, are you what? like, no, this is my stash. I'm fixing it. <laughs> no, so what <laughs> happens is I'll do the repairs that are easier for me that fit my skill set a little better. And then uh -huh. that'll go, sometimes it just goes on the shelf repaired and sometimes it won't get repaired until it's sold because small tip here, we'll put it on the website as is and we'll just say, hey, it's going to be painted if no one buys it. Sometimes we don't paint it right yeah, away. Yeah, we put like will be uh, painted on the website and it doesn't always get yeah, painted I've seen right that. away. But no, so yeah. there's, what happens is I'll get busy doing something like that floor project I talked about earlier and Jamie will get stuck like painting all the th all the thrift flips. Like she'll do like 10 of them before I even touch one. <laughs> a lot of times though, gotcha. well, I get what you're saying because a lot of times he'll have something in his car and I'm like, just so you know, I'm not painting that. Like I, <laughs> that's going to be a lot of work and I don't want to do that because there's just some things I know ahead of time are going to be work or I think it's ugly. And I'm like, I don't know what your vision is for that. So like, well, this goes back to where she, where I was like, if it doesn't look yeah. good, it's on her. No one blames me. Uh, we can't put that in the shop. Why did you thrift that? <laughs> so occasionally I do have to say like, are you sure you're going to get to that? Because Zeb has really good intentions of getting things um, done. 
But he, like I said, he does a lot of the big projects that are more important than the thrift flipping. So sometimes that falls to me. So yeah, there are things that I absolutely, I'm like, nope, that's just going to go on the shelf till you deal with it. But a lot of times I'm like, fine, bring it over here. Let's and- not overlook her air quotes on important. <laughs> important. That's, right. that's right. So I know, Zeb, you're drawn to the clocks, oh, right? I love clocks, um, yes. So, so you're making, so when you get a clock, uh, are you replacing the mechanisms and all that kind of stuff as well? So sometimes, so if it's something that I can repair and fix easily, which we, we try not to sell a clock that doesn't work. We have a lot of like clock parts. Um, we did a craft kit a while back and Jamie had to buy 500 of them to get the price she needed. And so now we have 350 <laughs> clock kits left. Uh <laughs> That's why you're into the clocks, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, most of the time, they're actually working. They just need a battery. Uh, a lot of times, the hands are bent or loose. So I'm getting decent at tinkering with the clocks. It's not, you know, something that I knew to, how to do beforehand. It's just been like watching a lot of YouTube videos and figuring things out. Uh, but you know, it's if it doesn't work, we'll disclaim that it doesn't work. And sometimes we still have, like, we've got an antique clock sitting over here from France that's leaning up against the wall. That's My clocks like don't work. I don't a care. A big grandfather clock. I'm never going to care if that works because it's just for looks. Like, I got my clock right here, so I'm not worried if that's keeping time. I would say this. I feel like that's true for so many clocks. I mean, I've got a clock in my office. I'm looking at um, up on the wall, and it's been uh, four o'clock for about four or five years. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> But I like the way it looks up there, yeah. right? For me, it's about aesthetics. So, yeah. But I would say if you look at our pile of things, like, that have not been attended to. It's mostly mine. It's mostly Zeb's. Because <laughs> if it's something that I can easily flip, I don't like things to pile up. Uh, so I will get it done. I will I will just put it all out. And I it, paint takes time to dry. So you start on one side of the island and you paint stuff and you just paint your way across. And by the time you paint everything all the way across, typically whatever you painted first is now dry. So you can second coat it and it just, you know, kind of work your way through. But if it, if I have to stop and find Zeb and make him repair something or ask him to repair something, sometimes that takes a little bit of a while. And so occasionally I have to say like, when we're out thrifting, it's not like I'm bossy, but I might be a little bossy. Just a little bossy. I'm a little bossy. Sometimes <laughs> I will say, like, you can't buy that until you deal with the 40 other clocks you have. And it's not that I'm trying to be mean. It's just because then it's we okay. have, I mean, sometimes you have to hear the hard truths. It's okay. Sometimes I still buy it anyway because I'm even though she's bossy, I'm good at telling her no. That's true. Very, <laughs> very true story. So what is the most, if you recall, because you guys have been doing this a long time, what's the most profitable upcycling project that you can think of? I would assume it'd probably be a piece of furniture, maybe. Um, yeah. So the furniture, anytime we do a dresser, we're, it's going to be pretty good. But what was... Well, so when we first started, for, uh, pianos. We haven't yeah, painted a yeah. piano in forever because we're not young anymore. Oh, but um, we used to get pianos for free. And we would paint them, yeah, people do- list them, and they weren't even super functional. And we could sell them for like four or five hundred dollars the same day that we listed them. It's really popular here in Utah to learn how to play the piano. A lot of people play in church and and do various different things. It's very popular. But you know, as kids grow up and move out of the house, we they have like this old busted piano that's been hammered on by an eight year old for X amount of years, and they don't want it anymore. So we would get these pianos and we paint them a fun bright color, almost make them look like a statement piece and house and we would get them for free because they're a real pain to move and people would put them up on like buy sell trade sites or whatever and we'd see them there and they'd be a hundred bucks 200 bucks i'm like i'll give them a month that'll be free and sure enough here's that if you can pick it up it's free piano and so we would go get those and and paint them and flip them and because we were willing to pick them up we could we could flip those we would sell them for 500 bucks and 600 bucks depending on how cool the piano was if we had to build to pay we would buy a piano and do it same thing with dining yeah. tables like um we would do a dining huh I said it was that sure for oh, you guys. Yeah, I mean, we, you I mean, we would was have a piano sold before we were done painting it. We just say, "Hey, we got another piano," and we'd have a list of people that were like waiting for us to finish one. Which was good because in those days we did we worked out of our living room, so we had like one spot <laughs> in our living room where whatever I'd recently finished would go until it sold, and then I would work in another part. And so, in order to make money, you have to sell that other piece because you don't have space. And so sometimes I would start painting something in the morning, list it in the afternoon, and then it would sell by the evening. Um, and 
I would do like dining table. Zeb wasn't home. He was like working and I would roll furniture end over end to get it into the house. This is before it. I came on full time. I mean, you do what you got to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, hopefully your backs aren't paying for it uh, today too much. Cause that, like you said, those uprights are heavy. They're, oh, they're yeah. very heavy. They're definitely heavy. So for folks so that are, second, we're gonna have to call, but we've got some uh, guy coming up. <laughs> I don't know what he's doing. Okay, sure. Hopefully he's leaving. I remember, you know, with Zebra, when we started uh, back in 2004, um, we were among the very few who did anything virtual. And uh, at that time, my son was probably about one. And uh, I was like, okay, I got to be on a conference call. It has to be quiet. No, no noise. And it's funny today. Now it's like, it's okay, right? It's like, it's okay to hear because how many people are working at home, especially, especially as we went through the pandemic, so many people went you know, stayed home to work. And then so many places now, are, a lot of people are going back to work. But however, a lot of people are realizing that they can be just as productive at home as they could in the office. Have like a flex schedule. Yeah. The Speaking of the pandemic, that's actually what kind of, I don't want to say forced, but that's when we started selling our furniture and things online in a bigger way because we didn't have anyone coming into the shop and we're still making videos and putting content out. And we were like accumulating dressers and, and you thrift know, flips and, thrift and... Flips and we're like, you know, we got to find a way to do this. And so we found a way to ship them. Um, we actually sell more dressers to the East coast than we do here locally. Yeah. Well, it's probably like a 50, 50. Damn I would say maybe. we sell it feels about, like more. <laughs> yeah. I would say about half the furniture gets shipped and same thing with our thrift flips. We do sell a lot locally, but it takes more than what we could sell locally to create a revenue. So as our business has grown, people want to have something that we've painted. And so we list it online. It does take uh, extra effort to list every unique item online. It's not like, like if you have a paintbrush, you can buy hundreds and you can create one listing and sell that paintbrush over and over and over and over again. Whereas when you're doing these types of items, you're sell you're listing it once as soon as it's sold, then that, that work that you went through to list it is done. So that's also the reason why we've had to streamline how we do all of our thrift stuff because otherwise it would take much time and it wouldn't be advantageous. Yeah. For us. We actually have a pretty amazing team. They, uh, Jamie and I don't actually do very many hours in the shop unless we do like a special scheduled meet and greet. When we're in the shop, it's usually before we're open and we're reorganizing and setting stuff up, delivering the thrift flips that we've just painted. Um, and we have two full-time employees that work in the shop that kind of run the front if we have customers. And if we don't have customers, they're dual trained and they're shipping stuff. Mm, wow, that is so good. That's so well said, too, to highlight the fact of, of you know, individual listings as well, because I was thinking about when you were saying that is the, the fact that some of those individual listings, the margins aren't really necessarily that high. No, you're making, yeah, unlike a rolling pin like this, you might I mean, pay one to three dollars and we sell them for twenty two dollars. So if I spend hours, in fact, one of the biggest, the chief complaints we get is how come your thrift items don't have measurements? And I'm like, listen, Linda. I like you. I do. But <laughs> I'm listing 50 That's plus right. items a week, sometimes more, especially like when we go to England, I'm listing hundreds of items a week. If I measure each and every item, I, A, I will never get it all done. And B, I will never make a profit. So that's why we do a lot of our live videos so people can see what they actually look like, not just one dimensional on a computer. They're seeing the item in our hands and kind of getting a feel for it. And then if somebody has, you know, a very specific measurement need, then they'll message Caitlin or the shop and we'll make sure we get measurements for them. But it's, it's, I don't know how people can, cause have you, have you ever been on Etsy or eBay and they just like really take 4,200 pictures and the, all the measurements on all the detail. I'm like, I just, it's a wonder we can sell anything at all. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's actually probably largely due to the live streams. Because a lot of times, like we, we, I don't even know if we got to Saturday when we were listing our week off. Oh yeah, we'll do Saturday. We show everything that we thrift. We'll thrift on Monday, process it through the week. Saturday, we do a live stream uh, in the evening where we just show what we thrifted through the week. And a lot of times, it's unfinished, hasn't been painted yet, raw from whatever, however we found it at the thrift store. And we're like, hey, we're going to do this and this. And we have enough people watching that, that usually by like Monday morning, most of that thrifted stuff we got the week before is sold. Yeah, I would say it's 50 to 70 percent, depending on the week sells before it hits the floor. And so we let local people know, like, if you want first pick on all of our stuff, 
you got to watch our thrift haul on Saturday. So that way you can order it and just pick it up at the shop. Yeah. Now, are you just to clarify, you said, because I, I know on your site, you do have those items that are for sale before they've been upcycled. It, were, you, were you saying about 50 to 60% of those items sell before they've been upcycled? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So every week we focus on when we're like, you know, we're talking about workflow. Uh -huh. if, if something has sold, those things get painted first. Mm -hmm. So that way we can ship them out. Gotcha. And then we paint anything that hasn't sold. And then we update the photos once it's painted. So sometimes there will be things like if we get busy and we don't get everything. If it's not sold, we may not get it painted right away. And then we'll have like a day where we just paint everything. And then we'll update all those photos in the system um, once it gets fixed up. Yeah, so like this, for example, I know we're showing this rolling pin a lot, but this was sold Saturday night. I didn't paint it till this morning. It's already been sold that whole time. And she didn't even know what it was going to look like when uh, when we got it done. She did. We don't do custom requests because we've gotten in trouble doing that or we've forgotten to do something just so it's kind of like back to the custom painting. Uh, but she's like, hey, can you stencil it? And usually I stamp these because it's much easier to just roll them along a stamp. But I stenciled this one because she asked, it's the first time I've ever even stenciled it. And I'm like, hey, I don't actually really like that. So like sometimes when we, we do that, we get uh, some pretty fun ideas too, just interacting with people. And, uh, you know, but it's fun that that was, I mean, that was just waiting for us to finish it. And then we'll yeah. take it to the shop and it'll get checked out. So I know we're getting close to wrapping up. Uh, I want to respect your time. You guys are very busy. So thanks for taking the time to, to come on here. But I, I can't leave without having you tell us a little bit about your UK trip because you've done this, what, twice now? Um, I think it's times. our fourth time, this last one, yeah. Well, we went to France. Well, we, we've only been to the UK. We've been to the UK twice, three, three times, three, three times, yeah. And then we went to France the first time. So we went to France first time, and that was a trip with a bunch of other creators and uh, furniture flippers like ourselves, thrifters. Um, we went and did that, and then the second time we went, we went to France first, and then we took the channel over to England. Uh, no, the second oh, time no. we went straight to England. Straight to England, you're right. And then the next time we did England and France, yeah. and then this last time we just did England. Um, we really like England. It's, it's really, well, it's they speak really English, easy. so it's it makes really life easy. easy. I like France too, but it's really easy. And we find a lot of the same stuff because, uh, pro tip, if you're ever thinking of doing this, the people from England, they like the French stuff too, and they've been over for you. This last time, you get, this, I was just going to say, this last time, was, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on in the world. So we just didn't want to go to France and England. We're just like stayed in England. But sometimes we'll just hop over the channel um, and go to both places in one trip. But the first time we went to France, we went with a bunch of people and we just bought everything that we could fit in our suitcases. And then we came home and I was shocked at how fast it sold and the dollar that I could get for those items. Because I wasn't even sure at that point, that trip was just like uh, for funsies. Yeah. But I was like, well, I'm going to let's see if we can actually make a profit on these items. Um, and everything sold really fast. We and almost paid for our whole trip with what we could fit in suitcases. Yeah, I was like, we could probably do this again. And so then we, we um, let's see, the pandemic happened. So we couldn't travel until 2022. And so we went to England that first time. And it, the first time we went to England, we uh, had no idea what we were doing. Uh, we had never <laughs> shipped before. And so we had to, I remember we had to get our labels printed. We did think I had to bring a scale. Yeah. We did have a scale, but we had to have our labels printed at a copy shop. And I'm sure you have followers in the UK and maybe they can agree or disagree with this, but um, e-commerce and business, so much more convenient in the States. I was not prepared for how long it was going to take for me to figure out how to email, then wait for them to print it, then sit there and they didn't print it all. And then we had to send it. Like it was a lot of logistics, but we, we figured it out. We did eight boxes. Yeah. The next time we started in France. We actually hauled our boxes over to England because we discovered it was twice as expensive to ship from France. So we just hauled everything with us and shipped from England um, on a boat by hand. We hauled these boxes and our luggage. That they was weren't ready for that. They we were, were we ready weren't ready that. and the, the people on the boat weren't ready. They for weren't that ready either. for that. But we made it happen. And then we did 10 boxes. And this last time we went, I said, well, let's try to, you know, we did 10 boxes. Let's try to do 12. I think we could do 12 boxes this time. And we did 19 boxes this yeah. last trip. And we shopped all day shipped all night and for whatever reason this time we had a very little car because rentals were super expensive so we had to ship every day because we couldn't haul that much stuff and our luggage yeah so the first couple of times were definitely like like Trial really ooh, ah, look at all this fun stuff sightseeing type trips 
that we worked on the side. But the last two times we've gone, it's been a lot of all business. I mean, we went and saw a couple of fun things. We went and saw Stonehenge and we went to Bath and saw the Roman baths and, and, uh, you know, we went to Oxford and looked at a couple things there. So we did do some touristy type stuff, but for the most part, it's like wake up at seven, hit the thrift stores, come home, ship it all, do it again the next day. Yeah, I was amazed. I don't know whether this might have been a a reel, but you guys were showcasing how much stuff you had packed into one box. And I was like, no way. <laughs> yeah. Like, how did it's, you? That reel is 100% true. That's crazy. That, that is how... That's the only way you can make money. I mean, it yeah, costs well, it so makes much sense, yeah. just take the trip and ship it that you have to, every square inch matters. And so when you're, when you're doing something like that, you're thinking, okay, if I buy a box this big, what will fit in the box? If I buy an enamel pitcher, what am I going to fill inside the enamel pitcher? <laughs> I mean, everything is inside of everything. Uh, we bought these canister sets and I thought those are great to buy because then they can all fit inside of each other. And every square inch matters when you're shipping like that so yeah you can fit a lot of stuff in a box it's a lot of like and we bring a lot of our own packing materials we pack very light so we'll, we're gone like 12 days we pack in an equivalent of a carry-on because we want as much space for when we come over we bring packing materials and when we leave we just bring all, no we ship boxes but we also fill our suitcases full of i'm sure those security guards are like what in the <laughs> world is in this suitcase <laughs> well i was just it, it was it was impressive to see everything out on the table and then to see that box and to realize that all of that stuff was in that box. And I think you said in that reel uh, that you, have you gotten all the boxes back now from, from the UK? Yeah. Okay. They, yeah. they all arrived and just getting uh, customs forms fall off and you have to re-email customs. Like it is a, it, you have to babysit those boxes until everyone arrives. And the, the coolest thing we shipped to this time was we bought everything, including the kitchen sink. Yeah, so we, we got bought a, a kitchen sink and shipped stoneware it type sink that's it's from London. It's a shallow because it was back when they were trying to figure out ways to save uh -huh. water in London. So yeah, it's, so it's just really sink. fun. We're going to use it in the Airbnb, nice. but it made it alive. Yeah, we were like, what? we tried to find some place that would ship it for us. They wanted 850 pounds. And I was like, there's no way I'm paying 850 pounds to ship this sink that I paid 60 pounds for. So we went to the hardware store and got creative and figured out a way to like put bumpers all around the edge and pack this up. And we're like, you know, worst case scenario, we have to put in a claim with UPS. Yeah. Best case scenario, this sink arrives alive. And then it oh, did. So. That's great. So you only just maybe just a few minor broken things then. Uh, out of all those boxes. This time was better than last. Yeah, the first, the second time, or well, the second time, we, or first time we went to England, I guess I should say, um, we had quite a few things break in the boxes but coming home. But now we're like, okay, we got to pack this up like Fort Knox. And we, we had a few things break this time, but it wasn't catastrophic. Mm. Yeah, you're getting pros, you're getting to be pros at it now. So one final question for the person who is interested in thrifting, Maybe, like I said, they're wanting to, maybe they want it to start as a side hustle or maybe full-time like you guys, like any like words of advice for a new person coming into the thrifting upcycling business? So if you're going to get into it and you're serious about doing it, sell what you buy. Don't just sit on it and hoard it because we have friends in the business here that have gone out of the business because they had eight storage units and they're paying $1,500 a month to store stuff that they bought that they didn't finish. So that, that would be like my number one thing. Like if you're going to buy it, commit to selling it and getting it out in front of someone and getting it into the hands of a customer. Uh, you got so many people will buy it and then they get overwhelmed and they have like these clearance sales and they'll sell it for less than they paid for it. I, my, if I take the time to source it and buy it and bring it home, even if I don't want to deal with it, I make myself deal with my stuff. And that forces me to be a little bit more selective when I'm buying because I know if I buy it, I've got to resell it. And then my other thing I would like to say is like, if you buy it, just buy things that you like because you could get stuck with them for a while. <laughs> like when I first started buying things, I would only buy things that I would put in my own home because I was like, well, if I'm going to go to the effort of refinishing it and somebody doesn't buy it, I would at least like the benefit of enjoying it. So I think that's kind of where... What's been successful for us is we typically will not buy things that we don't like. And so as such, we have kind of a curated style because it's just all things that we love that we would want to put in our own home. Yeah. Well, that's great advice. You guys have provided 
so much good information and guidance, and it's been really pleasurable talking with you guys. And uh, so I want you to share with our audience all the ways that they can contact you and get in touch with you and go to, go to your website, see the products that you have, and then follow you on Instagram, uh, all the social media channels. So we keep it really easy. Everything everywhere is Jamie Ray Vintage. The hardest part about that is Jamie is spelled J-A-M-I. There isn't an E on the end. So Jamie Ray Vintage on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Our website is Jamie Ray Vintage. Our app is Jamie Ray Vintage. Pinterest is yeah. Jamie Ray Vintage. And then our website is jamierayvintage.com. Yeah. Um, pretty much if you just Google Jamie Ray Vintage, even if you spell it wrong, you're going to be able to find us. We've been creating content. We have thousands of videos. And so we finally have reached the point in our life where we, I would say we're Googleable. Like you can, you can search us and find us. And if you want to find us locally, we are on Apple Maps and Google, Google Maps. We're in Lehigh, Utah, and we're open Tuesday through Very Saturday. Good. You know, by the way, before we go, I noticed that you guys have had a total on your YouTube channel of 37 million views. That is like phenomenal. Oh, I haven't even been tracking that. that. Yeah, <laughs> that that is like phenomenal. So congratulations to you both. Thank you. And uh, we really appreciate again you taking the time, and uh, we hope you guys continue to have great success in your shop and online and in everything you guys do. It's been fun and continues to be a lot of fun following you guys. You guys take care. Thanks for having us Thank on you. here. The Zebra Review category theme for December is chests. Our feature judge is Jen with Perfectly Imperfect Furniture. If you have refinished a chest from January 1st, 2023 through December 31st of 2023, simply use the hashtag Zebra Chests. Also, make sure you are following all of the judges along with that month's sponsors. This is a requirement to enter. Jen will pick her five favorites, then the remaining judges, Katie Cloud with Katie Company and Home, Lauren with Portland Row Living, and Jen and Amanda with Avenged Sisters will vote out of Jen's selections to choose the three winners. This month's prize sponsors are Shecto Interiors, Milk Paint, D. Lawless Hardware, Surf Prep Sanding, and Zebra Painting. Thanks for joining us. We are grateful for each of you. All links to artists will be in this week's show notes. We can't tell you how encouraged we are when we hear from you or when we read your reviews on one of the podcast directories. Speaking of podcast directory reviews, would you consider leaving one on your favorite directory if you haven't already? This helps tremendously in our ability to reach more people as well. It is a big boost to our ranking. As a thank you for leaving a review... We would like to send you a small gift. Simply screenshot your review and email it to me, laneball at enjoyzebra.com. Put podcast review in the subject heading and include your full name and mailing address. 